Hello everybody and welcome to Cars Etc Etc. A show about cars and a whole lot of other things, collectibles. And of course it's brought to us by altcointrader.co.za. Go and check them out, sign up and you can get into cryptocurrency and all of those fancy things as well. Today we are speaking about Rolls Royce. Yes, what a name when it comes to. Speaking of names, when you go and uh, Google Rolls Royce, the first thing you will come up to is uh, Marek Letoft. What a name, isn't that? A, where's the name from, Marek? The name's Polish. Polish. So my dad came into this country in the 60s with a suitcase. He's Polish, I'm African. But I mean, most Polish names don't have vowels. No, they don't. Uh, the deal was that my mother got to choose the name, but it had to be in Polish. So she wanted Gregory, which is Jegosz, which is, I think, only got two vowels. So she thought, I'll just take Mark because it's Marek is Mark. So, okay. Because, yeah, I mean, easy. one of my favorite footballers ever was Big, Zbigniew Boniak. Yes. And I just loved it because it was just so exotic. <laughs> it's like and yours you can as pronounce well. it correctly. Not bad. Yeah. Well, yeah, taking no, exactly. years. Well, taking yeah. years. Great to see you. Help. Thank you too. Great to see you. And, um, I mean, you are encyclopedia. When it comes to most cars... But I would say Rolls-Royce is, is quite your forte. I know. Um, and my mother's to blame for that. Because when I was a kid, I asked her what the best car in the world was. And she said a Rolls-Royce. Thank goodness. And imagine <laughs> if she said a Beetle. I'd be a different person today. You might. Well. <laughs> There's one thing that I've, I've always found fascinating. And Rolls-Royce, most people who, who would watch would sit and say, oh, well, Rolls-Royce, it's made by, my, by BMW. It's owned by BMW. But it's not as simple as that. Tell us the story of how BMW have acquired or make Rolls-Royce. It's a fascinating story because at the end of the day, what happened was Rolls-Royce was owned, and Bentley when they were together as brands, were owned by a company called Vickers. And Vickers was the equivalent of Arms Corps in South Africa. They, they made tanks and armaments and ammunition and all sorts of different kinds of things. And Rolls-Royce and Bentley as a company went into receivership in the 70s, early 70s, and that's when Vickers stepped in and bought them. Then in the sort of mid-90s, Vickers decided they wanted to unbundle, and what they then did was put Rolls-Royce and Bentley on the market. And therein, this most interesting and complicated story started to unwind. So the shareholders put it up for sale, yeah. Vickers, and along came BMW and made an offer for the company. And I think it was under 100 million uh, pounds at the time. And shortly after everybody was about to ratify that deal, VW stepped in and, and offered hundreds of millions of pounds for the company. At which point the shareholders all were like, wow, okay, hang on a minute. Yeah, sure. We'll, you know, we'll <laughs> do this. Signing. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll take the VW offer because um, it was so much more than the BMW one. And somebody didn't read the fine print. So the deal was ratified and everything was done. And it all happened at a time when Pech went on a brand buying spree. So he bought okay. Bugatti, he bought Skoda properly, he bought all of these brands. He was accumulating brands. And of course, one has to argue, aside from the tricolore hat that you were wearing and the obvious uh, reference to Ferrari and all of that, <laughs> um, Rolls-Royce has to arguably be the world's most well-known and exclusive and exotic car brand. Sure. And name. I mean, you always say something, it's the Rolls-Royce of watches or it's the Rolls-Royce of, you know, that, that's a, a term that's widely and worldly used. So Pich wanted Rolls-Royce. And somebody didn't read the fine print, and when it came to reading the fine print, they found that Roll, the, the name Rolls-Royce, the Flying Lady, yes. uh, I beg your pardon, the name, the grill, and the RR logos were all trademarked. The Flying Lady wasn't. And those trademarks were held by Rolls-Royce Aerospace. They make engines. Yes. They make the jet engines. They made the jet engine, Rolls-Royce. Correct. And... They then decided, okay, well, fine, we'll just renew the license. And Rolls-Royce Aero Engine said, I'm terribly sorry, you can't renew the license. And did a little bit more investigation and found that BMW owned 30% of Rolls-Royce Aerospace. <laughs> Hence the, we will not renew the license, thank you very much. 
And so the focus then at that stage we shifted completely to Bentley. So we got the first Continental GTs, everything, and basically Rolls Royce just died a slow and quiet death, so to speak, from yeah. from a brand point of view because. VW put no effort and energy towards it, knowing that they weren't going to be able to build cars after the end of 2002. I mean, it, it's beyond bizarre that, that uh, I mean, I, I can't find the, the right kind of adjectives. I mean, Rolls Royce, as you say, you know, it's the Rolls Royce of, of, of everything. Mm. They are extremely special. But there was this incredible gap that there was nothing yeah. because you had these two German empires uh, fighting against each other. And then what happened was, and BMW, in my mind, did the right thing. And both companies did justice to both brands, yeah. which wouldn't exist today if it wasn't for them. You know, Correct. It's so funny to have the purists, you know, toffing about the UK, going, oh, you know, this is not a Rolls Royce. Well, you know, so quite frankly, if it wasn't for the Germans, you wouldn't have the brand anymore. It would be dead. Exactly. Because they didn't have enough money to carry on running. The, the investment wasn't coming. Um, so BMW pitched and came to market with a Phantom, which was the most controversial car that, mm. that could possibly have hit the market. It was, it was jaw dropping for all the right and all the wrong reasons. I mean, I remember <laughs> when I first saw that car at the time I was running Bentley in this country and I was like, gosh, that's ridiculous. It's ugly. It's whatever, you know, and now you look at it and it's, it, you think, wow, this is actually something special. It hasn't dated badly. It did everything a Rolls was supposed to do. Um, the designer Ian Cameron put his design team into a disused bank building in, the, in Mayfair in London. And they lived there for two years while they came up with the whole design concept of the car. And it had to do this and it had to do that. And it had to maneuver through the underground parking of Heathrow. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's quite tight. And they, although the car was big, it was designed with purpose. Everything yeah. was designed with purpose. I mean, you talk about that Phantom. I remember the first Phantom I ever saw was a blue one. Mm -hmm. It was this unbelievable blue. Um, and it, it was in, in Hyde Park here yeah, in, in Johannesburg. And there was this old lady with this <laughs> like silver rinse hair, whatever. And she couldn't have been more than five foot two. And, and I just saw this, this car, first of all, then I saw the lady and I went, there's no way this lady's going to be able to park this car. But that was such a turning point for me in the world of Rolls Royce, because everything prior to that, was you knew it was a Rolls, but this was a huge statement. Yeah. It was a massive statement for, for, for the company. I'll tell you an interesting story about her. She has since passed away and you know, therefore I can tell you the story, but her name was Ruth Reed and she had her own clothing brand in this country when you and I were kids. So that was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, my mother aspired to wearing her clothes and Ruth always, because her initials were RR, she'd always driven a Rolls Royce. Oh, that's incredible. And our, we opened Rolls Royce in South Africa here. We started it at the Saxon Hotel. So I didn't have a showroom. I was based in the country and arguably the, one of the world's most exclusive hotels. And Ruth arrived there one day, short little lady, dressed impeccably all the time. Yes. And uh, she came and she sat down and she said, well, can, young man, how much is a Rolls Royce today? And I said, well, depending on how you cho what you choose and what you want it to be, um, it's round about <laughs> then at the time was four and a half million rand, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it was a lot of money then. Sure. We're talking early to mid early two thousands. And she said, "That's fine." She said, "I just have a problem with my current one. The hubcaps keep coming off. So, can you just make sure that the ones on the new one don't?" I said, "Don't worry, Mrs. Reed. It doesn't have hubcaps. You know, it's got mag wheels now, so you don't have to worry." <laughs> That's and so beautiful. She said, "I'll be back in two weeks with a check." And I was like, "Well, that's very unusual." And sure as nuts. Two weeks later, Mrs. Reed arrived with a DHL envelope that she had, and I opened it, and there was a check for the full amount that she'd paid in full and waited for her car to come. And, and she was just the most incredible woman. She was so lovely. Well, I, I mean, it's just so amazing. I mean, we've never, ever spoken about this story before, and yet you know exactly who I'm talking about. Yeah. I will never, ever, uh, that image is imprinted. I will never, ever forget that yeah. little lady in this huge, Blue and it was an everyday car. It was her only car, and yeah. it was her everyday car. Let's go back a little bit, um, 70s and 80s. Mm. You know, I, I, I really, if, if we go back to the vintage, you know, and I'm sure that you have a tremendous amount of knowledge. Actually, let's, let's stay there. Are there any or a lot of vintage Rolls Royces in South Africa? 
So you'd be quite surprised as to how many cars there are here. At, at one point in <coughs> the sort of from around about the 30s and 40s, there yeah. were four or five Rolls-Royce dealers across the country. Really? And there were a number of very, very wealthy farmers that had cars. So my guess is pre-war cars, mm. they probably, I would guess at this stage, and it's an educated guess, but I would probably reckon there'd be nearly 100 in this country. Wow. Um, some have come in afterwards, some were sold here new. Okay. And um, I, for example, have imported my own 1936 Phantom III. Um, so at the end of the day, there are a lot of collectors here who have taken up the opportunity of being able to bring in classic cars. Which is, I mean, that's, that's quite astonishing on its own. Clearly, they don't come up on the market that often. No, because, I, you know, when you buy a car like that and you go to the trouble of bringing it in, you ostensibly are bringing it in for yourself. So unless you have a full set of circumstances, you wouldn't really be bringing it in to sell. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't sell mine. You know, it, it's, sure. It, the, the pre-war cars are all quite unique. And obviously Phantom being the longest running motor car model designation ever. I mean, I think this year it might be, it, it's pretty close to being 100 years old that the name Phantom has been running for consistently. Hey? Incredible. Um, back in, Phantom was launched in the 20s. So, I mean, I don't have a calculator, I can't do mental arithmetic. But so the F Phantom one was, was early 20s. And you know, it, there's all, it's always been a very, very special car and really highly sought after. And also depending on the body style, because that was a time when you bought a chassis and you took your car, the chassis to a bodybuilder, okay. a coach builder, because build, they yeah. used to build coaches. That's it. And um, they, I think at one stage there were probably 50 or 60 coach builders in the UK, you know, wow. with the strangest names. I mean, I've got a book with all the coach builders in it. And I'll show you one day when you come and visit. But I mean, I remember my favorite one is there's one called Cockshoot. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, like I've had my body made by Cockshoot today. Oh, that's just um, beautiful. So, uh, and, and the different body styles, you know, some of them look like they were on acid when they designed them, and others you kind of think, well, really, could you have maybe taken acid? It would have been better. Yeah, maybe it would have been better. There yeah. was this, this whole sort of dichotomy of design and stuff as, as they unfolded. The, the, the thing with, with uh, Rolls Royce as well, and, and going back, I mean, how valuable are those pre war Rolls Royce cars? I mean, you know, if they do come up, most of them, as you say, are within families and they're going to be heirlooms passed down or whatever. Mm -hmm. If a Phantom One comes up on an auction somewhere, what sort of money are you gauging at for something like that? The, the defining issue of each of those cars is the body style okay. and the coach builder. So right. those two things come into play quite significantly. So I'll give you the perfect example. Um, I have a 1936 seven passenger limousine Phantom Three body by Windovers. Now, Windovers used to make the London taxis of the time, too. Okay. And they weren't the most sought after or desirable coach builders. And the seven passenger limousine car is also not necessarily the most desirable car. So that car would probably, let's say, have a value of one and a half million rand. But if it was a convertible, two-door convertible, bodied by a Mulliner, bodied by a Park Ward, bodied by a Gurney and Nutting, that figure could be up to five, six, seven million wow. rands worth, if not more. Sure, okay. Also depending on how many of them were made, because yes. certain body styles, they may have made three or four, they may have made 10, whatever the case was. So it's really that varied. Now, let's move on to like the 70s and 80s mm. Rolls Royces, because there's quite a few, I think, yes. Yeah, yes. Um, in, in South Africa. Are they still, there's a couple of questions. Number one, are they still quite sought after? Are they, are they sort of available? And if one had to purchase, if I all of a sudden say, I want to be like Marek and I want to have a Rolls Royce, so I go and find myself a little silver spirit or, and I say, oh, I've picked it up at, I think, a bargain. What's it gonna cost me to get it decent? Okay, so yeah, there are quite a few of them, and I think it, it is becoming a more sought after car for a number of reasons. Um, my dad always used the term the 50 year syndrome. So when okay. you get to the age of 50, you've hopefully got no more dependents, as in all the kids are out of the house and you know, you don't need to worry about looking after them, says me who still lives with my father. Okay, um, tick. The, you then don't have a bond. 
and you no tick. <laughs> you then get to buy the car that was either your poster car, your desire, your auntie's car, your uncle's car, your grandpa's car, or something you really always wanted. Yeah. And if you follow the 50 year trend, it will explain, for example, why something like the E-Type became so popular. Because they're not scarce. Yes, and, exactly. And they really are not scarce. There are scarce examples of them, but as a brand, as a car, as a model, it was not scarce. Um, terrible car to drive. But it was, you know, for those people at that age, it was their poster car. And arguably, 100%. it is one of the most beautiful cars ever made. Yeah. Um, so or designed. Yeah, yeah, correct. Designed. Yes, that's yes. actually the better definition <laughs> of the word. So the, the classic Rolls Royces, as I would call them, are becoming more desirable. And also, they represent great value because... Today, a car in South Africa, a new car, is, is ridiculous. I mean, a Datsun is nearly 200,000 Rand. Mm. Um, and you could probably pick up a decent Silver Spirit, I would say, from anywhere north of 350,000 Rand. Wow. Depending on the year model. So year models made a difference because okay. they had certain technical changes on them. And uh, the biggest one, they launched Spirit, for example, in 1980. Mm. First cars came to South Africa at the end of 1980, early 81. And the difference between an 81 car and an 87 car is quite significant. So you'd probably want the later car, but obviously there'll be a price difference. And there we started doing quite nice volumes of cars. So from Shadows, which were launched yes. in 68 and ended in 1980, um, to Spirits, we probably got in the region of about, I would say, about 2,000 cars mm. in the country. Wow. Okay. I never knew it was that much. Yeah. Uh, that, that's quite a significant number. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, if you divide it up over the years, it isn't really. But yeah. it, it, when you put them all together, you think, wow, that's, that's quite a few. You know? It's quite a few. Some of them have unfortunately, you know, definitely failed to proceed by virtue of the owner's antics or whatever the case may be. And then keeping a car like that. Well, you know, there's an age old adage of good quip is deed quip. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in that. So I'd rather buy a car that I know is some kind of history provenance okay. being Fair looked enough. after. Um, there are a couple of experts out there who um, know what they're doing. And it, it's a totally different ownership experience. I, I would probably say realistically, if you looked at budgeting at about 20,000 Rand a year to look after the car, sometimes you might spend five, sometimes you might spend 50. It just averages it out. Okay. And it, it's quite low if you consider what owning a classic Porsche or Ferrari, I'm sure, would be. Correct. Um, in, you know, from a maintenance point of view. It is a complicated car in the sense that Rolls-Royce took, literally, he took the best that existed and made it better. So braking system and suspension systems are Citroen-derived because Citroen had the best had the suspension. Best. Um, their brake pedal has no feel when you touch it because everything is designed to be effortless. You can steer the car with one finger. You could literally brake it with one toe. You know, that, that's Incredible. the effort required. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions, however, have been, you know, well, I don't use my car that often, so why do I need to service it every year? That's a big problem because it's a machine and things deteriorate with, the, you know, not being used enough. And then the guy will say, well, we need to fix this and do this. And the people will say, well, I'm not spending that right now because I don't really drive it. And in 10 years time, that little problem has become a big problem. It, it's that same old adage where somebody has, you know, a vehicle. So you have your Rolls Royce and now, uh, you know, all of a sudden, well, you have to get new tires. And you go, I'm not spending that amount of money on tires because it, I can't really show it. It's like a grudge purchase. It is a grudge a purchase. Service, yeah, you know, exactly. Servicing a car is a grudge purchase. Yeah, but if you don't it. maintain these cars, whether they're new or whether they're classics, you're going to land up with, you know, big Spending bills, more. Yeah. big, big bills. Yeah. Let's just jump forward quickly. Um, people who buy Rolls Royce today, are they the kind of people who once they've got a new Rolls Royce, do they look at the past of Rolls Royce and go, oh, I'd love to have a Silver Spirit. I'd love to have a Ghost. Uh, or, or are they a different kind of um, buyer? It's a really nice question that I, I believe that, and I've seen, if we have to generalize, mm. that it's a new kind of buyer. The brand has moved with the times, it has changed. Yes. And I think from my point of view, you're either a person that will appreciate classical things in your life, and it's not just necessarily cars. If you can appreciate older stuff for what they represent, then 
and I'm talking about really appreciate it, not just be somebody that goes, oh, that's nice. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. A true aficionado will want to have an immersive experience. They'll want to own it. They'll want to have that proper feeling for what it was like. Yeah. And unfortunately, most people today are not like that. So they, they will go, well, yeah, that's a nice old car. Um, whereas the new one has completely redefined what the brand is. It's kept to the essence of it. Everything, the essence is great. The car is yeah. amazing. But it's definitely moving with the times, which if you look back to the 90s, you could probably criticize them for not having done that because a 1990s Rolls Royce had nothing in it like a 1990s BMW, you know, top of the range BMW, nothing. There was nothing technologically advanced about it. There was nothing, it didn't have the features. It didn't have any of the kinds of things that it had. It had a name, it had a beautiful design, and it had lots of leather and wood. Yeah. And, and that's where it Rolls. ended. And it was a Rolls. It so was a it, Rolls. it was a Rolls. Yeah. So you, you couldn't actually, you didn't want to compare it to anything because it would lose. It didn't have yeah. the performance. It didn't have any of those kinds of things. So you might argue that that was a better, uh, BMW 750 IL V12 was a better drive than your Rolls Royce. Yeah. But it wasn't a Rolls. That, that's the point. And it got to a point where that wasn't enough. Correct. Because I think customers were kind of like, well, really? Same um, kind of money, if not a whole lot more money. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I want just want that, I want a spec. Yeah. I, I want, want a spec. So I can have pink leather <laughs> and, and orange paint and whatever I want, but it's not enough. And that's where they've done themselves justice now. You know, everything is up to speed. The technology is amazing. The, mm. They go the extra mile. And that's the whole basis of their philosophy, which has made them so successful. And today it seems as though they're very bespoke. You, totally. You know, I, just as anybody who buys a, a, an expensive vehicle, where whatever brand it is, you know, you go in and, oh, well, I'll choose that stitching, mm. etc. Mm. But Rolls Royce just seems to be, this must be one, nobody else mm. can have it, end of story. Yeah. You know, you go and buy a Ferrari, okay, I want red stitching, somebody else gets red stitching. He said, no, 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 my Rolls, one of a kind. Yeah. And, and, you know, they don't make too big a song and dance about it, but, but really and truly, and Rolls-Royce are the leaders when it comes to that because mm. not only will they bespoke what your car looks like and feels like, they will build you your own motor car. And we've seen two examples <laughs> of that, Sweptail being the first, which yes. is the most beautiful creation of a motor car in my mind. And recently the, the car that um, Beyonce took delivery of, you know, no one was supposed to know who, but everybody does kind of thing, you know. <laughs> really, there's nothing more than having a car built for you. I know Ferrari do the same kind of thing, but it's all followed on from what Rolls-Royce have just been quietly doing. You know, they, nothing like going, being invited into a room and going, listen, we'll build you a car, tell us what you want. You know, that doesn't get better than that, does no, it? No, that's for sure. There is something, and you know, just on the Rolls-Royce experience, because you know it so, so well, uh, there, there are a couple of things that I've heard over the years, and, and you can clarify them for me, that the size of the wheel was half the height of the car is one that I'd heard. Um, and the other one is that the Rolls Royce badges would always face the right way. So the, the, the design element is correct because okay. it, it, it harks back to the age of the, of the coach builders designs where you actually look in, in the times of the 30s, Rolls Royce wheels were pretty much like 19 and 20 inches. Mm -hmm. You know, it's only with time that wheels went smaller and then, you and know, they got we, bigger again. It's like fashion, you know, soon we'll all be wearing bell bottoms and have mullets again, you know, <laughs> well, go and dig out those I, I don't know. If, no, no, mullets. We've got hope. Oh, no, we've got, got hope. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got hope. We've got hope. <laughs> I didn't say man buns. We pretty screwed there. <laughs> no, yeah. But um, so, so literally that was a design element of what made the cars all look right. so chic. And the, the self-centering wheel centers was actually something that, that new phantom launched okay um and that was just an extra they called them the wow factors you know they they wanted and that's where ian cameron really did such an excellent job designing phantom they, every Maybe. if if you look at the fact that the tail lights are small because all the cars through the ages the tail lights weren't the focus they were small the back tapered to a point to make it look less bulky there every as you go through each design element every line has a purpose um the coach building designs always had sort of a waft line, you know, about them. And all of those things have been incorporated into the, to today's designs, which, which make the cars look special and unique. Not everybody will appreciate them necessarily because they, they need to be narrated. You need to have them, someone needs to tell you about them. 
you know, the spirit of ecstasy today, if you look at on, on the designs of the modern Rolls Royces, they all have a chrome line up through the middle of the bonnet, yeah. which used to be the, the hinge of the bonnets when they opened separately as two bonnets. And they then took that a step further by giving the wings of the spirit of ecstasy a wake line on the bonnet. And, you know, the, it, all of those things combined into it just being a really, really beautiful and unique car. Uh, it's it's quite extraordinary, you know, mm. what Rolls Royce is is all about. We all know Rolls Royces as being mainly four door cars. And I want to go back. I think it was the Camargue. Yes, it was the Rolls Royce Camargue, which was a two door, rather peculiar um, in terms of its shape because it's like well, we still want to have all of the space for four people, but we're just going to make it make it into two doors. I mean, are these um, desirable cars? Do people sit there and go? Got to have one of those. Okay, so you picked <laughs> one of the interesting ones, and I'm sure you picked it because it was designed by Pininfarina. Yeah, so come, your yes. Italian connection. You come in, how am I going to tie this back to Italy somehow? Somehow, you know, some, you know what? <laughs> call me out, call me out. But, but uh, and, and kudos for that. However, I think Pininfarina was out the day they designed that I car. think so too. Um, and they gave it to a guy who really just had a ruler. Probably me, yeah. someone like me, <laughs> just went, oh, like a geometry just class. Square, oh, just square like, it off, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Why do you want anything sleek? Um, so we, we've kind of alluded to the fact that it is lauded as one of the world's ugliest motor cars ever. <laughs> and there's so much irony in all of this because it's started developing a cult following. So they only made just over 500 of the cars. Okay. And so David Plasto, who I had the, the pleasure of meeting, was the person who was working for Vickers at the time who then took over Rolls-Royce and he spearheaded the development of this car. And it was originally going to be a Bentley and it was originally going to be turbocharged all those years back. Mm -hmm. it took them another 10 years to figure that out and, and come up with that as a concept, which it probably would have done it more justice to do that. They made one Bentley Camargue, which were, and the only difference is at those stages being radiator grill and badges. Because wow. Bentleys at, the, at that level were all badge engineered Rolls Royces. Okay. They were cheaper by very little, and fewer people bought them because they th were thought to be less ostentatious. I don't know how that works, but anyway. <laughs> so they become more desirable today because they're rarer, because no one wanted them then. Having said that, I digress. The Camargue um, was, the most expensive car in the world when it was launched. Wow, it that was, I didn't know. It was launched um, in Italy, and uh, was it launched in the French Riviera? Somewhere around there, and it, it just was ridiculous. It launched an, uh, the first fully automated air conditioning system. So at a point, Rolls-Royce were technically ahead of the game. The air conditioning system in that car at the time cost as much as an MG Metro. <laughs> which, I mean, you could buy a whole car for the price of your air conditioning, air conditioning system. system. So it was the first air conditioning system to have an auto function where it regulated where the air flowed and you set the temperature to whatever you wanted and it stayed there, um, which was revolutionary. No one else did that. You just either, either had air con or not, you know. So we have roles to thank for that today. <laughs> and um, proper four-seater and really it just, it stayed. I don't know why it stayed. They launched Camargue in the late 70s and mm -hmm. it was based on the Silver Shadow platform. Yeah. Then they swapped to Silver Spirit, which you wouldn't really notice. Only by the exhaust pipes can you tell. So the okay. Shadow-based cars have got two pipes out the, the one side and the uh, Spirit-based on either side. And they were nicer cars because they'd upgraded the suspension. They, were, they drove better, you know, but inside they were no different. They didn't change anything until they stopped making them at the end of 1986, Jeez. by which time I think it was 525 cars okay. odd. Um, more popular, obviously, in the Middle East and America for two reasons. It was the most expensive car you could buy. So you've so got, to have, go. it, got so, to have it, you know. Um, and the second reason was it, it kind of had an appeal to those markets in a way because it, they may have been perceived to be more garish and, you know, less tasteful. Um, <laughs> so it's the car that Take everybody that. loves to hate, you know, from that point of view. But, yeah. but certainly it's polarizing. If you, if you Google the worst looking cars in the world, it's in there. It'll get up there. It's in there. In and, the yet, and yet all of a sudden it's becoming a cult kind yeah. of thing. Um, Rolls Royce drop tops, uh, Corniche. Yes. I just I just think of Elton John. Yeah. Um, and just marvelous French Riviera white Absolutely. seats, just magnificent. I mean, you know, these cars they must be sought after. Very sought after. Now there there's a car really really worth having. Um, yeah. So 
between 1980 and 1990 in this country, there were only eight cars brought in, um, of which um, sure. seven are left because one's gone to Australia with its owner. He took it when he left. And, and truly, truly desirable cars and lovely, lovely cars to have um, for all the right reasons. It's just, it's still gorgeous to look at. It's timeless in design. And, and it really just, it, it's, it's an old money car. You know, it's, yeah. it's just, it's, everything is right yeah, about it. You, you've arrived. Yeah, yeah you, you, you've, you've, like, you've got a corniche. It doesn't matter how new your car is. If you arrive in a corniche, roof up or roof down, you don't even need to say anything. Yeah. It's just like, you've out, outclassed everybody. <laughs> It is. I mean, it's just something so special about about um, Rolls Royce. I mean, a, a car like that, one has to assume, will increase in value. And they do. They have, and okay. they will, and they continue to. And good examples in this country are upwards of one and a half million rand. Wow. Um, and if you consider where they were and when they started, and you know, it's it's a safe bet. If you want to buy something to have fun with it, you know. As long as you look after it, it it's it's definitely I mean, the way to go. That, that just sounds like incredible value. I mean, it is. you know, one and a half million rand is still one and a half million rand. But I mean, one and a half million rand for a Rolls Royce Corniche, which will take everybody's attention. Yeah. Everybody will look at it and stop, no matter what you are in. It, and it, I, you know, people go mad for Mercedes Benz Pagodas, the, the convertible yes. for the '60s, and it's nice. You know, I'm not a fan, but it's nice. I've got to give it that. But why is a Corniche worth a million rand less? You know, you, you kind of have to give it a mm. bit of context here and go, this car's got to go places. This is, this is really, on, it's a no-brainer that these have to go there. They made fewer Corniches than they did SLs. The, the Rolls are, you know, have probably been maintained better. There's a lot of restored SLs out there. Of course. Some better than others. But really and truly, it, it's, for me, it's a no-brainer of which of the two I'd rather have. Yeah, I mean, it just does. It, it, in a way, it doesn't make sense. No. You know, and you, you can take four people in the car with you. You can take the children with. Maybe you don't want to, but it, it's like but it does have the, the opportunity. Yes, it, yeah, it, it, it does. There, Marek. I mean, we could talk for ages, and and we're definitely going to come and visit um, and and see some of your collection um, of not only Rolls Royce but but of of other vehicles as well. Is Rolls Royce? Final question to you: Is Rolls Royce? the ultimate car in my mind yes i mean it is biased come such it's like <laughs> i could ask you a similar question in terms of <laughs> different brands and stuff but but it has to be you know it it's it's got it's a brand with the most mystery it's in terms of the stories that surround them it it's mm. they, they had customers in the 50s and 60s like nubar gulbenkian in the uk and he was an armenian that had come to um the UK with nothing and had amassed a master fortune uh, in gas that I th I'm not quite sure of his full background and how it all came to be but but Gulbenkian used to have his cars specifically built for him but he was the kind of person that would literally dress up like a tramp and go into the Rolls-Royce dealership in Barclays Square to order his car and see if they and they'd be like Mr. Gulbenkian we know it's you <laughs> you know please take a seat you know come and do your thing you know, it just has, it has stories like no other car brand has stories. Well, I, I mean, the Sultan of Brunei, I think, is the largest um, Rolls-Royce collection in the world. Him and the King of Morocco, believe it or not. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, you'd be very surprised about, about some of the collections out there. The Sultan of Brunei, now, there's a story on its own right in terms of cars, but you can thank the Sultan of Brunei for the fact that... Rolls-Royce is alive. Three companies are alive. Rolls-Royce, Aston Martin, and Ferrari. Because during the, the 90s, when mm. the early 90s, when the world was falling apart, um, he was buying cars, and Prince Jeffrey were buying cars that Rolls-Royce designed cars specifically for him again. Yeah. They, he used to take six of everything. Correct. And the Rolls's, I don't know what the others cost, they were a million pounds a piece. Then. <laughs> He has station wagons of things. He has four-door versions of things. He has got limousines of things. He's got two-door convertibles of things. He had Rolls make him an SUV. It's uh, based on a Range Rover chassis. It was called the Bentley Dominator. It, it was there, six of them, you know, and, and probably one of the best-kept secrets. Every now and again, you get a spy picture of a car somewhere. 
and people would be like, what is that? You know, um, Rolls-Royce launched a concept that was called the Bentley Java and we were all so excited that it was going to be built and they never made it. They made it for him. They made him a convertible, a coupe, a four-door. They made him all kinds of versions of it, six of every single one. So literally those factories worked for him in his entirety. But the philosophy of what they were doing then is slowly filtering through again now, which is really amazing. Sure. Okay, last final question. Rolls-Royce's future, I mean, the, 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 the styling is more dramatic than ever. We have a, a very different kind of audience, but we still have, the, uh, I think, an, an elderly audience who still love their, their Rolls-Royces. The future of, of, of Rolls-Royce, is it very strong? Is it Absolutely. I think it's, uh, you know, under the helm of BMW, it, it, mm. it can only go from strength to strength. It's obviously going to be all electric. You know, it, it, it's probably the brand that makes the most sense to be all electric because the whole thing about a Rolls Royce was how quiet it was, Correct. how effortless it was, how all of those things about, you know, at 60 miles an hour, the loudest noise is the ticking of the clock. I mean, where else do brands have those adages? You know, there's none, of, none of them do, you know. Yeah. At 60 miles an hour, what's the quietest thing in a Ferrari? Your passenger, because they're cucking themselves. I don't know. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> it, it, there's no other brand with wonderful stories like that. And, and I think that they, f they suit where it's going to. They yes. really, really do. Makes sense. And, and they've learned that they can push the boundaries on design and be radical with launching something like Phantom with, when they did in the early Correct. 2000s. So I think it will always, it, it will wow people and, and it should wow people. You know, I, I've visited the factory over many, many years of being involved. I've been involved with roles uh, for, since 1999. I owned my first one when I was 21, a few years before that. And, you know, you see the change in mentality. The, the people at the factory used to be like their customers. Oh, no, no, you know, can't possibly do that. You know, somebody would want to come along and, and do a pink car and they'd probably refuse them because it's not in keeping with the brand. Correct. Now it's like, so you want pink? How about we add a blue stripe down the middle there? What do you think of that? You know, and that's how the world's changed. And I think that that ensures your success moving forward. Agreed. And I think the way that they've um, embraced it. Totally. Um, as well, and you know, the audience and the people who are buying it are sitting mm -hmm. and saying, well, I, you know, I can afford a Rolls and I want it pink and I want it. Yeah. Well, you know what? We'll make it for you. And it's going to be well in the done. music video. You know, you're not some landed gentry, hot toffee it, person, you know, buying our exactly. car now, riding it to the races. It's, it's cool. When was, I don't ever remember, people, my friends used to laugh at me. You know, everybody else wanted a GTI and whatever, you know, I wanted a Rolls. They were like, dude, you know, sorry. Not cool. Um, now it's cool. Know, now it's cool. You know, now young kids come up to you and they go, wow, this is amazing. And I was like, geez, you and me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could see it. Merrick, we could talk for hours. I, I, we're going to do this again. Thank awesome. you for your insights because, I mean, you are just an encyclopedia. Thank you. Um, just, just Got to use it somehow. I mean, shit, what else am I going to do? <laughs> there, there we go. Use it, use it. That is Rolls-Royce. Yeah, and a lot more to come when it comes to, to the world of Rolls-Royces. We're going to go and see some beautiful cars as well uh what a pleasure to have this chat i mean i've just learned so much as well and so many wonderful wonderful stories let us know in the comment section what you've uh, been thinking of and also um this is cars etc etc brought to you by altcontrader.co.za go and check them out register and go and play in cryptocurrency until the next time i shall see you take care ciao ciao Ferris Cars is a Ferrari specialist dealership in Santon, Johannesburg. Since 2010, Ferris Cars has dealt in all things related to Maranello's finest, from classics to the contemporary. Sales, service, advice and exclusive events, Ferris either has it or has access to it. And of course, in partnership with Altcoin Trader, Ferris Cars accepts cryptocurrency and can even help you buy your dream car from any other dealership in crypto. Check out their website at ferriscars.com or follow them on all popular social media platforms.